Hello and welcome to the CX Files podcast for March 17th, 2022. It's St. Patrick's Day all over the world. And I'm Mark Hillary in Sao Paulo. And I am your resident Irishman, Peter Ryan. And Mark, let me just emphasize, I, like you, am a proud holder of an Irish Republic passport. So if anybody's got a right to be celebrating today, it's you and I. Well, yeah, I'm also an Irish citizen as well. And I think that probably that's a, that's a secret that people don't guess when they listen to this. We've got a Canadian and a British guy, but we're both actually Irish citizens as well. Exactly, exactly. And very proud to be an Irish citizen. Really happy that we're recording in St. Patrick's Day. And I am especially proud that I am recording this today from New York City, where I happen to be on some business meetings. But I don't think you're going to find anywhere more festive on St. Patty's Day than New York in the United States. I've actually got thousands of video games at home and I, you know, they're going right back to those early days of things like Pac-Man and Frogger. But if you look at the modern gaming industry, um, it's actually now a huge slice of the global entertainment business. In fact, I think if you add the, the entire revenue generated by Hollywood um, with all recorded music, then gaming is still actually much bigger. And so I know that you, Peter, you talked to Mike Piccicello at Global Step about how CX yeah. intersects with gaming. What, what, what came out of the conversation for you? Look, Mark, um, like myself, Mike is a Montrealer and I got to know him several years ago. And I can say he's truly one of the most talented people in the CX space. Now, recently, well not recently, in the last couple of years, Mike went to work for Global Step, which does have subject matter expertise in the gaming industry. And for me, I thought it was important that we get an interview for the CX Files with Mike, given the fact that, as you say, gaming has become such a major part of the entertainment sphere, but quite frankly, the global economy. If you take a look at the amount of resources that are being pumped into the development of games, the marketing of games, the support for games, it's truly quite staggering. And I'm, I'm happy to say that in this year's 2022 Front Office Omnibus Survey, where we survey this year nearly 700 enterprise decision makers, we've actually broken gaming out as a distinct segment. And I'm very anxious to see what the key results are. Now, in terms of the key results or the key takeaways from Mike's discussion, I think for me, probably one of the most important things was the fact that he was highlighting that, well, I think there's an impression out there that the gaming industry is going to be ahead of the curve when it comes to all things technology and CX. In Mike's view, there's a lot of work to be done. Now, it's not to say that all gaming companies or all gaming organizations aren't doing a good job, but Mike really left the impression that there's a lot more that they need to put an effort around in terms of being able to actively engage with gamers who are coming from all different walks of life to make sure that the questions that they might have, the queries that they might want resolved are done in an expeditious way and being done with the right channels. And for me, it was a real bucket of cold water because I was always under the impression that the gaming space was truly doing a bang up job but according to Mike who's really at the coal face of this uh, as I say there's definitely more improvement that has to be made. Yeah and I think that one of the areas where I've noticed gaming has really been leading the CX industry is in the idea of going for subject matter experts so traditionally you'd hire people into the contact center because of their their voice and their attitude uh, their aptitude towards helping people and then you'd train them on the stuff they need to support um, but, but quite often now gaming companies are going after gamers specifically, especially the gamers that are fans of their particular games, and then asking if they want to help support the, the other gamers. You're spot on, Mark. And I think that what for me really stands out with what you just said, finding those not just subject matter experts, but people that are passionate about products or specific services. And there's lots of them out there, whether it's gaming, whether it's fashion, whether it's sporting equipment, whether it's computers. There's so many different people out there that not just want to perhaps give their advice, but are actively seeking a way to promote and evangelize these products or services. And this, I think, falls even into our longtime discussion that you and I have had with our friend Terry Reibold about the gig economy and leveraging that business model as it relates to some of these different products and services that you can find these great brand ambassadors around that are in a position to potentially give that support, but using a potentially a funky and new way of doing, doing it. 
Yeah, and I think that um, specifically from Mike's discussion with you, I thought it was really interesting how he talked about change, changing demographics and how um, video games are now being utilized by people from, you know, from seniors yep. right down to kids. And the thing is that when you often see uh, a mainstream media report about gaming, they still talk about Donkey Kong as if games from the 80s are what people are still playing. Uh, and of course, there's retro enthusiasts, but that's not the majority of gaming now. You know, people are gaming on their phones, on consoles. Um, it, it's it's an adult pastime, but I think that you know the fastest growth is in the over fifties segment. So so this is really interesting. I, I, yes, it is in the over fifties segment, and I, I I'm happy to say I'm still not there yet, although I'm close. Uh, Mark, you beat me to it. But th let's think about this for a second. You know, when we were talking about the extent to which gaming has taken into all different uh, age groups. If you were buying the original Pong system as a teenager back in the mid 1970s, you're cashing your old age pension check today. So that just goes to show you somebody who's been an enthusiast since the original days of TV games, as we called them when we were growing up. It, it just takes into account so many different people from so many different backgrounds. And as you say, so many different channels in terms of how to play these games. So I think what our listeners are going to hear this week is a real, a real overview about where the CX industry needs to pull up its socks if it's going to adequately service those gamers and i think some really fresh ideas from mike in terms of where the industry is going and what the gaming players can do if they're going to remain relevant yeah and of course pong was a great classic but if you can remember breakout on your atari um, oh, well. where you had to bounce the ball against the wall and knock the bricks out that was Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak that coded that before they went on to found Apple. So uh, well, fun, fun fact for you there. Fun fact for you, exactly. And there's so many great games, as you say, that so many of us grew up on. And I'm sure the listeners would love to hear the story one day about how you and I had a mega Atari gaming session with your Atari flashback console in Sao Paulo back in 2015. But that'll be another story for another day. I think I, I've never been beaten so badly at Missile Command in my life. <laughs> All right. So let's go and talk CX and gaming with Mike Pipicello at Global Step. The CX Files is delighted to welcome Mike Pipicello for this week's episode. Now, for those of you who don't know Mike, he's the Vice President of Client Services for Global Step, which is a leading provider of technology services for video games and digital initiatives. At Global Step, Mike's responsible for the strategic management of senior level client relationships and ensuring customer experience excellence. Mike's also a resident of Montreal, my hometown, and Mike, it's great to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for having me, Peter. Looking forward to it. Well, it's, it's always a pleasure to connect with you, Mike. You and I have known each other for a few years now. And one of the things that I always look forward to whenever we have a discussion is the fact that you bring some fairly, very fresh insight and some very strong opinions to the CX table. And that's refreshing in this industry. Yeah, yeah. Always uh, good to have a good stance on uh, what you think of something and being open-minded for sure. But uh... Uh, I think that's what's important, right, for our, our clients and our customers uh, to give them strong insight on what to do. So let's talk a little bit about gaming and CX when it comes to gaming. Obviously, this industry has become a much bigger part of the CX dynamic over the course of the past several years. And I would dare say it's one of the fastest growing verticals as it relates to the take up of customer experience management. Maybe as a starting point, Mike, what do you see as the biggest customer management challenges that the gaming industry has today? Yeah, definitely. So I completely agree. I mean, it's definitely one of the industries that have has grown the most. If you think back, uh, you know, to the, the 80s when, when video games really started to take off, uh, you know, it was a very specific demographic that played, right? It was the children, teenagers that played. And as uh, as we get the, the world becomes more digital, um, you know, games are, are at the fingertips of, of everybody, right? So uh, it's the older generation uh, that's grow growing and, and uh, using uh, mobile devices that download games on in the app stores. Uh, so really, I, I think that there's two big, 
things that are driving challenges for customer support. Uh, in the, specifically in the, in the video games industry is one, it's such a diverse demographic, uh, even within the games itself, the, the genres, there, there's so many different types of uh, people uh, playing. So there's not one way of, of having the right type of support. Um, and the, the second thing, as you said, it, it's the, the hyper growth of it, um, keeping up with the demand and keeping up with the changes and, and how it's evolving has been, has been difficult. And you, you really take us back in time when you talk about the evolution, Mike, because, you know, we're roughly the same age, and I'm sure you have the same experience I did. Eight or nine years old, we were on the Atari 2600 for hours, but it was mm -hmm. really very much a case of probably kids between seven to 12 years old who were playing video games and probably getting bored of the different cartridges moving on, given the limitations of the technology at the time. But it strikes me that we are now at a point in the gaming industry where as you talk about the different varieties of games that exist, the, the myriad of different options somebody has when they're playing a game, you could literally find yourself on a video game or on a video game system for days, if not hours, depending on how much you're into it. Yeah, and that's exactly it, right? Is that when you really peel back uh, a video game, um, you're not you're not selling uh, you know video game companies are not are not selling a product that has a specific design use right so I think that's was something that uh, is very unique so in my mind the only other experience like that is is a movie right you're the the point of the video game the point of of that interaction is you want to uh, escape and go and immerse yourself into a totally different world and escape from troubles. Uh, and you you nailed it right on. You know, people can be playing for days on end because you know they're playing for ten minutes uh, between dinner or between meetings or on the bus. Or it's no longer just on console where where you're playing for a fixed amount of time after school or on the weekend. Uh, so as that as that changes in in the in that world, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult and more imperative that uh, the games companies uh, solve their customer support problems. Because as you mentioned, there's so many different options out there. Uh, if you're downloading uh, a game and, and it's not working as you had hoped and you reach out to support or you decide not to reach out to support, uh, it's as simple as delete and move on to the next, um, especially in the type of different operating or business models that are out there now with you know, free to play and, and um, uh, you know, play to earn. Uh, it's not always the case that someone is buying a game and, and committed to it because they've paid for it, right? So it changes the aspect and the dynamic of it. Okay, so then putting all the cards on the table here, Mike, how are the video game companies doing in regard to getting in front of some of these CX challenges? Um, I think there's, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, for a couple of different reasons. I think that um, one of the, the major things is that, um, one, there's very limited amount of data, uh, I, I'm finding. Uh, there's a lot of good business analytics that goes behind, um, you know, how a game is performing in terms of downloads and, and you know, length of time people are playing. Uh, but the deep understanding of why people are not playing anymore or abandoning the game is, is lacking. Uh, I think that's something where typically, uh, you know, the support or post sales function kicks in, right? You're, you're taking feedback from people and hearing what they're saying and then feeding it back to your development team. Uh, I think that that's something that's lacking in, in the industry. Um, the other piece too is that the bulk of uh, support is done, and part of it, it's, it's because of the demographic, uh, but the bulk of the work or the bulk of the support is done uh, via a ticketing system. And we all know that, you know, as soon as you start implementing ticketing systems, um, the response time is not where it should be. So what uh, I guess the challenge I see is overcoming and reducing that, that, um, that time to, res to resolve uh, because all that time lost is potentially your, your customers, your players moving over to a different platform, moving over to a different game uh, and losing, uh, you know, uh, money or, or players in the, in the process. Um, so I think those are probably the, the two biggest challenges where I see the support world uh, is behind. Um, and there's not very many uh, 
players or, or vendors uh, that understand the games world as much as maybe other industries. So let's talk a little bit about the end user, the individual that might be having to avail themselves of the customer experience support from a video game company. We talked a little bit about how the demographic has changed over the course of the past three, four decades. And I think that that's definitely clear from when we first saw the, the initial Pong that came out in the mid seventies, all the way to 2022, where it, it, you're virtually talking alternate realities, which is quite something when you think about how rapidly this technology has evolved. From your perspective and experience, Mike, what does the typical profile of a gamer look like who might be looking to contact a CX department to try and find out how they can download something or how they can get to the next level within a video game or to troubleshoot an issue? So it's everybody, right? Like that's that's where I think the, the industry is now. Um, there's, you know, um, so many different genres of games that, that, that trying to, to target a demographic in specific is well, virtually impossible, right? Like you have, uh, like you take myself as an example, I grew up in the, in the video game, uh, era as, you know, Nintendo was booming and all those great things. But, uh, now I've, I've lost touch with that technology from a, uh, a, a a certain game perspective, but am I still a gamer? Absolutely. You know, I have games on my phone uh, that I play. I have, um, you know, I still buy the EA NHL sports games to play. Uh, so what what I think is is important is that the common thread in all of these is that the person playing or the the, the profile of the person playing is, is is taking a break from from their current reality. They're they're playing to escape. Um, and that could be for a whole bunch of different reasons and uh, different different demographics and every different type of game or different profile is playing a certain uh, different um, version. What I think is is important to to align in your question is that uh, as the business because of this, the business models have changed. So you have, um, still the, the genres of games where you walk into a Best Buy, you purchase the game, you bring it home, you put it into your 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 console and you play. That's that's one, right? That's the typical, I'm paying $80 up front. Then you have the, the mobile world that's very popular now where it's free to play. So you're downloading the game, it's not costing you anything. But, you know, to move up levels, you might need to spend a little bit of money with in-app purchases. Then you also have um, the... Um, play to earn type of games. So you're you're playing and you're so invested in the game it was free but you're you're playing to earn um, items within that game. So it could be new avatars, it could be uh, new items that you're you're uh, as you pass levels you earn new items. It could be who knows NFTs or maybe even crypto, right? As we move forward into the into the um, into the world. So what's what's key to know is that for each game, there's going to be a different need or a different um, importance to respond and how you respond. So some might still be email, some might need to be phone, some might need to be a uh, chat. Uh, and I think that that's where the industry uh, is leading and, and uh, gaming companies need to think of. But you, you raise those points and I think they were bang on every one of them. And that implicitly brings in the need for not just accurate data, but a lot of data to be able to build those profiles up to understand exactly the type of profile of what somebody's going to be look like depending on what type of game they're playing. Because I think when I think about the type of game I would play or you would play, that's probably very different relative to somebody who's 16, 17, 18 years old. And yeah. you, you made me feel old there, Mike, when you mentioned that you were from the Nintendo generation. I, I'm from the Atari 2600 and Intellivision uh, generation. So, you know, I, I, I feel all of a sudden like the, the gray hairs are coming out. That said, it, it does raise the point too about the individuals that are providing the level of service. It raises a question about who is best suited to be able to handle video game support, whether it's tech support, customer support, et cetera. So based on what you've seen, if you're looking at a profile, who makes the best support agent for a gaming end user? 
So this is going to be cliche, but I believe it. Go I for mean, it. it. Go for it. I mean, it's, it's, you need to mirror your customer, right? Like, uh, I mean, that's true in, in every, in every industry. Like, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get agents to handle um, retail, uh, you need someone that understands the, the demographic of where they're shopping and what they're shopping for. Uh, and, but it's even more the case with the games, right? And, Again, people are playing not for a purpose. They're not playing because because it's going to get them from point A to point B. They're not playing because it's going to solve a problem. They're playing because they're trying to escape. So if something's not working and they do need to get in contact with support, you want to be in touch with someone that understands that ex- escape, that you know experience. Uh, so that, that's number one. It needs to be someone who's in tune with that specific genre of, of gaming. Um, you know, they need to, to understand that uh, and empathize that, hey, I took you away from your escape. And not only that I take you away from your escape, but I'm creating another problem that you were trying to escape from, right? Like the last thing you want to do is have someone playing to escape from a problem. And then, you know, they need to email or call or creating no. another problem that they're trying to escape yeah. from. Uh, so it needs to be someone that can empathize, understand um, the nuances of the game as well and the characteristics of the game. Uh, so it's hyper important that you, you know, the, the, the partners, the vendors, whoever is also uh, onboarding uh, people that are passionate about that game itself. And, and it really strikes me that as you mention, and I think very succinctly, the fact that when you're playing a video game, you're doing it to escape. It's like you referenced movies earlier. It's the same thing you're looking to escape. And if something goes wrong with your streaming or something goes wrong with your DVD player, you want it fixed now. And you really need yeah. somebody who's going to be in a position where they're going to take that initiative. Based on what you've seen also, Mike, this is one that I think the business model comes down to. Has the gaming industry lent itself towards work from home? Because that's always the impression I would have had that, that a work from home agent would be very well suited to supporting an individual end user that might need assistance with a game or a gaming issue. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely. Like, uh, for instance, uh, where we're at now, uh, the the at Global Step, the vast majority of, of uh, our employees are are working from home. Um, you know that model works well, and I think works well for for our clients. Uh, the the other the other aspect of it is as well uh, is that um, uh, I, I didn't mention it before, but um, depending on the structure of the of the organization or partner vendor, whatever you want to call it, um, is if they have other elements of that support within the organization, for example, a company uh, like ours at Global Step, we also offer uh, testing services. So as an organization, if you're understanding not only what happens on the, 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 the front end or what your user experience is, but you, under, you have the DNA of understanding the back end, you can, you know, uh, better be equipped to, uh, to handle those queries. But absolutely a work at home model uh, is is very successful for us. So then let's ask a question around technology. Obviously, the buzz currently is around AI-enabled chatbots. The buzz is around self-service. What do you see as the role of these frontline technologies in the gaming sector? So from... From my perspective, I, I, you know, the the chatbots and, and all that is is absolutely needed. Um, you know, the interesting thing is, is that in the game space right now, like I said earlier, most of the support is coming through on uh, web forms. Um, it, it's I find it ironic that the video games industry is one of technology that's so far advanced in many different ways and behind the, on on that. So I think that there's going to be a huge leverage and and push on technology and chatbots to solve things that uh, should be deflected away from web forms and and emails, uh, things like reset password. Um, you know, a, a lot of that is, is parts of the the problem. That's that's a big contact driver for them. Uh, and then um, the more complicated things is where I think we need to start humanizing it, right? Of uh, again, feeling feeling the, the 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 pain of that of that gamer of that player. Of um, I'll give a, a perfect example, uh, a personal one, um, and it's a huge huge brand name too. Um, my son is uh, is completely immersed into Roblox. 
um, we, we had uh, he had a problem with his uh, profile um, two year two years ago. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of effort that he put into uh, gaining different articles and different uh, different items. Uh, and because he is not allowed to play during the school year, um, he's, he forgot his password. Uh, so when he went to uh, to log in at the, in the summer, uh, it didn't allow him to to log on because we didn't have he doesn't have an email. There was no way for him to reset the password. So we needed to contact. We needed to contact support. It was via email. To this day, I still do not have a reply. So we had to give up and and uh, open a whole brand new account starting from scratch. So he was heartbroken, right? All the progress he had made throughout the whole year, playing the game on the weekends, everything was all completely gone and starting from scratch. So, you know, it's really striking the balance between what types of contacts need to be handled now quickly to get me back online and which ones need to have handholding and help because it's that important to a player and i think that that there's a big difference between the two and too many of the contact drivers are, are dumped into one so yes technology i think is is uh, going to be huge in solving problems but i think compared to other industries where where uh, in, in support that they're moving towards technology, um, video games needs to pull back a little bit and add some human element to it as well, which has been really lacking. Well, Mike, this has been a fascinating discussion about an industry that's really, I think, taking the CX sector by storm. We wish you all the best in 2022, as well as for Global Step, and you're welcome back on the CX Files anytime. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. We really appreciate your feedback and suggestions. You can reach myself, Mark Hillary, or Peter Ryan via LinkedIn. Please also leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast provider, as that helps more people to find us. As always, we'd like to thank Chris Haig at Traction Media for the CX Files graphics. See you next week. No, I was just, just going to say there's a lot of... Uh, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. <laughs> That'll be our blooper. <laughs> yeah. All right, then. <laughs>